So before we go on to a time in the Royal Fusiliers, um, were there okay. any other uh, more memorable times with the Royal Green Jacket? Oh, I mean, I had hundreds. I, I mean, hundreds. Uh, the one with the, with the general that was that was very. Uh, there, there were there were ten thousand guerrillas in this camp, and there were um, I would say hundred hundred and fifty behind this general. And at one stage, they were all just firing weapons in the air. Uh, and we, the platoon commander, thank him, wasn't m myself, was there with with a, these a uh, couple of these guys trying to talk to the general, and the rest of us had just crept into these fire trenches and just thought, you know, you thought guys through my mind, we'll just take as many as we can. Um, and it was, say, at that stage, it was, it was, you know, you obviously were worried, but there's nothing you can do. You couldn't run. You, know, you wouldn't have got any fun. Um, and if you ran, you would have probably started them. So you just you were there, and it was great. That was extremely good. Um, but I've... Far East jungle warfare courses, jungle survival courses were, were awesome. Being in, again, being in different train, being in the jungle is probably my favourite area for soldiering. So could you tell us a, like, a bit what kind of things we'd asked to do in your training as jungle um, I, I don't have jungle warfare survival course uh, in Malaya, um, uh, uh, which was really good because we stayed through Hong Kong and you have to acclimatise, so we had three or four days in Hong Kong, which was fantastic. Then we got to the business part, flew into to, um, Singapore, uh, Oh, and as an aside, we got put up in a really quality hotel because we had officers with us. So, you know, we had, and at this time, I was another rank. I was an, uh, a sergeant. Um, and then we moved up to Johor Bru, uh, just into Malaya. Um, and I remember the first, second day, we were in uh, the survival area, what they call the survival area. And there was a attack hat, which is a you know one of these sort of um, fronds, you know, the wooden things with the with the with the roof open, and it was tiered. And we were sitting on the tiers, looking down, and there was a lectern. And the main instructor was an E-band tracker um, called Wingang. Um, now, if you don't know, the E-bands were tribes. The tribe, and they were still, at that stage, still very much tribes. Osman tattooed from there down. Um, yeah, oh, deadly. Um, and he was sort of chatting, and he had an interpreter next to him. And he was sort of chatting away about different things, and it was this was you must have this when you go out, you know, you must look for this, and it was just generalising, generally talking about the survival. And as he was talking, there was a white sort of plastic gunny sack at the at the base of the, and it moved. And so everyone sort of looked at the sack, and he just was carrying on talking, you know, and no, no, it can't be done. So it's, and and it, it moved again. So now. Sort of three quarters way through his, his presentation, that, that this sack is starting to move, uh, and he's obviously seen that. So he, you know, okay, open the sack up, shot his hand in, and pulled out uh, had the snake right there. So he pulled out his brain, and went, and took, took the head off, and went and drank all the, the blood and fluids. Blood, good. And we're all <laughs> so we're all sitting there. Um, yeah, it was a fabulous moment. I mean, brilliant. Uh, so that that was the start, and then we went from there. So in, and then in that exercise, there were because you're moving so fast, you don't tend to catch much. You put your traps out, um, but you don't tend to catch much. So I was eating ants. Um, that, that they give us a treat one day. They shot a flying fox and just nailed it to a tree. Uh, and which is, and if you don't know, it's like a squirrel, but it's really scrawny, so it's, and it's all muscle. And, um, but there were there was a whole course of guys racing to try and hack a piece of this this um, flying squirrel, so we you could eat it, you know. But, uh, yeah. So that 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 was a great experience. Um, I really enjoyed that. Taught me a lot about the jungle. Um, jungle is you, is very friendly if you know what you're doing. Um, you know, it's easily it's easy. It's probably one of the most easiest. Uh, to survive in, um, but you know you you have to know what you're doing. Uh, and again, say then when I went to to do a jungle warfare course, which was a tactical course, three months um, uh, in Brunei, uh, I put a lot of that to to good use, and that was good. Yeah, excellent. So they were a couple of really good times. Um, I enjoyed I enjoyed being. If you're going back again, um, 
in Germany, as a colour sergeant, I was the 2RC recce, um, and I did the, uh, we worked in scimitars, which are small armoured, very fast. That was great. Um, I remember being in Canada, on an exercise, we went to Canada, and you train in Canada because you have planes. Um, and as recce, my job was to lead in battle formations and, and form a start line so the armour, the tanks and the armoured infantry can st- would start there and go in the right direction towards the enemy. Um, well, we were exercising with, with tank troops who'd been there so many times they knew where they were going. So at one stage, at the middle of the night on the prairie, I was racing 60 tonnes of tank and sort of 10 tonnes of CRT. CRT. We were racing neck and neck. So I was determined I was going to get to the start line first to mark it for him, um, and which we did in the end. Uh, and that was quite hairy because he was on the train and we were on the rough. So we were bouncing. Yeah, loads of stories. I could go on all day. So <laughs> you want to crack on a bit more? So, and what year did you apply um, for the role as Royal Peter Air Captain? Uh, um, <clears throat> it's, it's slightly different. Uh, um, I applied for a PSER role. Um, the the way I arrived at C Company was uh, to the Fusiliers was through London District, where I was actually they required someone to in in a department. But this was the stage they were trying to understand the TA, so they had a, a regular army team who had done air, what are called SPS inspections, um, which were inspections on regiments to see whether their administration and um, uh, G1 was up to, 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 to scratch. In a regular army, the setup's completely different. Uh, in the TA, you know, they, they were getting hammered because they weren't being understood. So I was drafted in to the office as the TA representative and spent a year on inspections and, and trying to guide the team. Um, to, you know, to, to make them realise what, what the differences were. Whilst that was happening, a f- chap called Chris Mears, who was a fusilier through and through, he was far more a fusilier than I ever was, um, was dying of sc- cancer, um, and he was the PSEO. Uh, he died, unfortunately, um, and there was a gap, uh, and I'd been seen by, by the, the, the regiment, and they asked me if I would like to take the job, uh, and I did. So that's, that's how I come to become a... Uh, PSCO at C Company. So how do you find your role now different to your deployment so to see your training to see? Well it's, uh, first of all it's static I, <clears throat> you, you, I left the regular army so you leave the regular army and you take on a TA commission it's full time but it's a TA commission sorry let me just have a mouthful um, so you're sedentary, you're one, I'm only in Balham, I, I don't move around, I don't get posted um, and I'm outside of the military all back. So we have a company command, a company to uh, the structure of a company, and I'm outside of that. There's, there is no equivalent in the regular army. Uh, my role is continuity. I'm there to make sure I look after the administration of the company, the, the building. I interact with the associations, with, with um, museums, or, or you know, all of the extended fusilier family. Um, I, I interact with or on behalf of the company uh, and I interact with the battalion who is made up who are made up of separate companies of separate cat badges we have a London Scottish London Irish uh, Princess of Wales Royal Regiment so the, the regiment is a mixed regiment so I, I represent C Company to that from a permanent staff point of view so that's that's my role so it, it, it's totally different to anything you'd get in, in, the, um, in the regular army it's a fantastic role it's just not very well understood. So do you find this role um, harder or easier to carry out compared to your, uh, your previous work? Um, I, 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 it's the, the level of difficulty comes with the level of inexperience at higher formations. Now that's awful, isn't it? Now, some, the, the TA, again, uh, regular soldiers find it very difficult to understand the TA. Uh, when they're posted in, uh, and they're posted in the positions of, of authority. You, know, you have um, sometimes it's a regular colonel, sometimes you, 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 you don't. It's a TA colonel. We've had TA colonels for the last couple of years. You always get a regular training major who's the senior regular officer 
uh, you get a regular adjutant, regular RSM, and then regular training staff, SPSIs, and they are allocated to companies. If those coming in take on board the, the TA way, and the TA is the same as the regular army, it's one army now, that's what they're saying, one army concept, but they do have completely different, um, I don't know how to explain it, TA is not a regular soldier, he's not a regular soldier, he's not there 9 to 5, or he's not there 24 hours a day, you know, 365 days a year. When he turns up, when he turns up for parade, he is on military duty. When he takes himself away, he's not, and he, it is his choice. So that sometimes is very difficult for a regular to understand or to, to accept. So depending on the level of, of depending on how the, the, the regular staff view this, will depend on how difficult my job is. If I've got to spend all my time trying to explain that you can't do that, then it gets more difficult. If they're on side and we work together, it's very easy. So yeah, so that, that probably, I probably said too much there. I hope this is not going too far. Uh -huh. uh, so do you like your current job or do you miss being deployed overseas? And, yeah. I miss being deployed. I love my current job. I, lo I, <clears throat> I made a conscious decision uh, years and years ago. I, there's, there's always that time when you want to, you know, there's a promotion stream, um, you go up or you go to the side. I just decided I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I wanted to, to enjoy it. Give my service. You know, I, I never did not do what I was, was asked of me, but if I had the choice, I was choosing choices that maybe wasn't the best for my career, but it didn't matter. So I, I wanted to do what I wanted to do. Um, and I love the army, I love the people, I love the, the way that everyone interacts. Um, when I got too old, as you do, uh, and they throw you out, um, I didn't really want to, to get outside of the military the concept and um, a job come up um, with the TA as a, as a, a non-regular permanent staff, um, which I took. And again, threw myself into that. It's a different situation. Yes, I'd love to go back out and do my, you know, all my stuff in Zimbabwe and in the jungle, but I couldn't do it now. You know, I'm too old and my body would collapse. So I, I understand that. So I'm still involved doing something I really enjoy. So um, how do you feel then when you see like the young soldiers who get deployed? Does it remind you of when you know you were that age and getting deployed out? You know? I, I, I'm jealous as hell. No, seriously, jealous. I, I think jealous is in a nice way. You know, I, I just I, I'm I'm glad that they're doing it. I if I think they're doing it for the wrong reasons, then I will talk to them about it. If they think they must do it because they've got to show they're a man, but they're not really up to it, then I don't think it's the right thing to do. Um, if they want to do it for the right reasons, you know, they want that bit of adventure, they are determined and they are honest about it, then, then I think it's great. You know, I really do. Um, not from the point of view, I don't want them to go and shoot people or blow, th I think I want them to shoot people if the people shoot at them. So I think it's, it's the soldier thing. You know, that's it. They're going to go and be a soldier. Great. Yeah, that's what we do. So, was anyone else um, who was in the Royal Green Jackets with you, did they follow into the Fusiliers or is it just yourself? There has been a number of cr cross um, postings, uh, well, not postings, there have been a number of people who have joined the Fusiliers from the Green Jackets. Um, not necessarily many. You tend to stick with your, your regimental family. Um, being... The, the job of PSEOs, or the, the non-regular permanent staff jobs, come up at different times in different areas. So um, you're not always guaranteed to get to stay with your regimental family if you apply. So, for instance, m m when I was in London District, um, the time that I was offered the job, it was C Company. So you can't guarantee that you would, you would be with your regimental family throughout. But most people try to stay that way. Um, but I can I can say, to stay quite honestly, I love the fusiliers. I, I they <laughs> they think the same as the green jackets. We are very much of a similar mind. You know that it's soldiering first, um, and you know you do your job, you do your duty, and, and they're very proud to know that they are very good at it. And that's exactly the same. So I've had no problems at, um, adjusting, and I just take it on board. I think it's great. My guys are good.
So do you have anything in your career that you would, uh, that now you think, look back and think you would have done differently? No, 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 no. I've, you always look back. Uh, and I'm, I, again, I made a decision quite a while ago. There's no point in looking back. There are always things that you could have done differently. But I'm never sure that they would actually make it better. It may make it better, you know, in the immediate thing. It may have, it may have given you a slightly better edge at that time, but I don't think it's necessarily going to affect the whole. So, no, and, and you can't waste your time thinking about what you could have done. That's crazy. No, but this is why I want to go and, that's why I made this and go and do what I can. I went and done as much as I could, because I thought, if, if I end up thinking, I wish I'd have done that, then I would have, yeah, I would not be happy in my old, in my retirement. So out of your whole career, thanks from your training now, what would you say has been uh, your favourite tour or your most memorable moment? Um, I, I, I don't want to pick a memorable moment. I think some of the... the it, it, always react, it always revolves around um, action because that, that... If you're involved in something like that, it just does clarify... It, it becomes very clear in your mind. But it's either that or you, you, you cop it. You know I mean, so you... Do. I remember being in, in Ireland um, when, when a bomb, when there was a bomb, a car bomb, um, and I was the, the patrol commander first on the scene. Uh, so it was my job to, to, to clear the area and get the, the cordon out and things like that. And um, I remember it was in a place called Dungannon, and it was in the main square, and there was a very small road leading in the square, which was built for carts in the old days. So it was an old town. Old and um, it's probably about three strides. And I was on one side, and my two IC had somehow got on the wrong side. Um, but we, we we didn't know when this bomb was going off, and it was the bomb was about uh, 50, 50 yards away, um, and direct line of sight down this. this. Uh, and he ran across the road to me, and as the bomb ran off, uh, as he ran, the bomb went off. And on his second step, he was going this way. He put his foot there, and his next step, his foot was about four foot, five foot that way, and he carried straight across, and his momentum took him through behind where, where I was behind him. Um, no problem. He was his hearing was a bit affected, um, and he was a bit shook up. But afterwards, where I was, there was a telegraph pole, and there was a chunk of car, probably about that big, embedded three inches into the telegraph pole, uh, and that was very. It's very clear in my mind, um, and I remember that. And, and yeah, it was it's a very clear moment. Um, remember being how I felt in a place called Lesotho when we were we were shot at by rebels, and we were in a sheep corral. Um, and it, yeah, lots of things.